Hey guys, I'm Rachel Cruz, your host for this episode of Dave Ramsey's Greatest Hits, where we are remembering the best of the last 10 years of The Ramsey Show on video. And in the words of Dave himself, buckle up, buttercup, because we're going back to some unforgettable moments of tough love. To kick things off, let's find out why Dave thinks that some of you need to be in a panic right now. Check it out. What type of account do you recommend for Baby Step One's emergency fund? William says on Twitter. You can follow me there at Dave Ramsey, and anytime you'd like. The, um, I, you know, Baby Step One is a thousand dollars saved, William. It really doesn't matter what kind of account you put it in. It's not going to make any money. If, if there's no such thing as a ten percent account on a thousand dollars, I mean, it, it's you can put it in a money market if you want, and you're going to make one percent. And so we're talking about $10 a year. So I don't care if you even put it in an account is my point. I don't care if you keep it in the sock drawer. I just want you to have $1,000 set aside that you don't touch for anything. Now, if you want to put it in an account, it just be a little money market type account at your local bank where you can get to it if you have a, an emergency. The downside of keeping it on the sock drawer is you might think the pizza man at the front door is an emergency, and he's not. So you need to be careful about how you define emergency. This is just to be used for emergencies. One lady took hers and put it into a frame. She bought a cheap frame down at Walmart and wrote under the uh, wrote across the bottom of the frame, uh, in case of emergency, break glass. <laughs> <laughs> and then hung the $1,000 behind her coats and her closets. It's because, I mean, you're not going to make any money on it, William. I mean, it's just, it's there just to be used only for emergencies. Only for emergencies. That's all it's for. And, um, you know, your little $1,000 account, hopefully. Now, when you grow the account up in baby step three to a full three to six months of expenses, then I'm going to keep it in a money market account. Even at that point, you're not making any money. Let's say you've got $15,000 in there at 1%. It's 150 bucks. I mean, it's no money at all. You're not making any money on this account. So the emergency fund is not about making money. It's insurance to keep you from cashing out or going into debt, cashing out stuff you shouldn't have to cash out. And so insurance doesn't make you money. Insurance costs you money to protect things that make you money. And that's the best way to look at your emergency fund. It's not an investment. It's insurance. And that helps you if you do it that way. So, I, you know, when I had, when I finally got $1,000 and then I finally got $10,000 and, and, and it was all I had, I was all concerned that it needed to work really hard. And, and you know, I started realizing that it's not going to work hard when it's in an emergency fund. And so then I wanted to start investing my emergency fund. Well, that's a dumb idea because by definition, an emergency fund needs to be easy to access, what we financial people call liquid. And so you have to set that aside. You just set this money aside and say, it is not for, it's not the money that's going to make me money. It's the money that's going to protect the stuff that makes me money. I don't have to, I, I can, you know, when you've got a big emergency fund, you can carry a higher deductible on your insurance, which causes you what? have lower premiums. When you've got a bigger emergency fund, you know, you, you don't have to tap out your 401k or borrow on your 401k if your car's transmission goes out. And so you get to leave alone the things that are making you money and you get to increase your, decrease some of your costs like insurance and those kinds of things. You don't buy insurance on everything that turns around because you've got fifteen or $20,000 set aside for your rainy day fund. One lady called it her GOK fund, my God only knows fund. And um, I don't care what you call it, but that, that's how you do it. So good question, William. I appreciate you bringing that up. So baby step one is $1,000 saved. Two is pay off all your debts except your home using the debt snowball where you list your debts, smallest to largest, and pay them off in that order with great focused intensity. Once you're out of debt, then you go accept your home, then you go back to the $1,000 account in baby step three and raise it up to a fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. You need to run like your hair's on fire until you get those three steps done. You need to be in a panic until you get those three steps done. Because if you have $15,000 or $10,000 or whatever three to six months of expenses in your life represents in cash in the bank, and you don't have any payments but a house payment. Just think about your life right now. How would that feel? 
no payments but a house payment, and fifteen or twenty thousand or ten thousand dollars laying there. You're not even there yet, and you just started breathing better. Just thinking about it, you took a deep breath and a sigh. <sighs> it's exactly what you did after I said that. When you don't have any payments but a house payment and you have your emergency fund, that's a foundational place to begin to build wealth. That's a foundational place to begin to, to your level of outrageous generosity. But until you get there, you're just scrapping and clawing like a rat in a wheel, man. And so you have to break the cycle. You have to flip this thing on its head and make it behave. You've got to get so fired up and wired up that your broke friends think you've lost your mind. If people aren't making fun of you, you're probably not on track. Because people are stupid. People are broke. They said and I heard as the dumbest financial planning firm out there. Because if you look around, 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. $1.4 trillion in stupid student loan debt. Another trillion in stupid credit card debt. Car fleeces. 78% of the cars that leave a new car lot are fleeced right now. And most of the rest of them are financed. Stupid is on parade all around you. It's a clown show financially. You want to be that? I don't want to be that. That's where I, that's where when I hit bottom, I mean, I, I didn't hit bottom. I completely splatted because I was stupid with steroids, man. I know what stupid looks like. I looked that boy in the mirror. I know who, who he is. He was wrapped around my neck. And so you don't want to live like that. But your foundational stuff is to at least get rid of your debt, not counting your home. And at least get you a rainy day fund. And you don't need to be doing any investing until you get that crap straightened out. It's time to put on your big boy pants, your big girl pants. This is grown-up talk here. You're not in Congress. You have to live on less than you make. You have to apply yourself to these situations. You have to look in the mirror and look at each other as a married couple or as a single. Look in the mirror and say, no. We're not going on vacation. We're broke. We have two car payments and a credit card loan, credit card debt and a student loan that's been around so long we think it's a pet. No. We're not going out to eat. We're not going to strut around acting like we're something we're not. Tom Stanley, who wrote the book Millionaire Next Door, his last book he wrote before he was killed in a car accident a couple of years ago was Stop Acting Rich. It was the title of the book. It's a great title. Stop acting rich. That's what it comes down to. Quit acting like you're something you're not. You don't have any stinking money. Act like a broke person. Why? It's easy. You're a broke person. You make 60 or 90 or 160 a year and you got nothing. Nothing. No money. Payments coming out your ears, out of control, strutting around acting like you're something. In Texas, they call that big hat, no cattle. Stop it. It's time to lay these basic steps out and lay into them and say, that's it. I'm tired of being broke. I work too stinking hard to be this broke. I put up with too much crap to be this broke. And ain't anybody going to fix it in this election cycle. The only people going to fix it is in your house. The White House isn't going to do nothing. It's your house that's got to do it. The people in your house got to start behaving. And then you can turn your money around. But it's an act. It's a. It's an act of adulthood. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. This is the Dave Ramsey Show. So my grandfather, when he was a very young man and newly married, started a business. And about that time, the Great Depression hit. The stock market crashed. He lost his business. He was blessed to get a job in Alcoa, Tennessee, with Alcoa Aluminum, back in the day. He ended up working there for 38 years in the accounting department, was one of the head cost accountants when he retired. I heard the story growing up, I didn't witness it, that he had a bit of a temper. 
can't imagine that in the Ramsey family. <laughs> and uh, apparently, as the story goes, he was uh, at my parents' house, who were newly married, and they're probably 20 years old, with a little kid, me, running around. And my mom reached to uh, put some leftovers away and pulled out aluminum foil, only it wasn't Alcoa aluminum foil. It was, God help us, Reynolds wrap. Well, apparently he got so angry, he took the Reynolds wrap and pulled it all out all over the backyard, went through her cabinets and threw out everything that was Reynolds wrap in her cabinets and said, Alcoa Aluminum has supported this family for decades and you will not dishonor that. Now, was that a little overboard? Yeah, yeah, definitely a little overboard. Ramses have a tendency to be overboard sometimes. I, I'll go with that. But it's an interesting thing that, that I think is missing today in our culture. This idea that the company that you work for gives you money, therefore feeds your family, allows you to live your dreams, uh, allows your children to go to school and puts clothing on them and food on their table. And I know corporate America is not loyal to the worker and doesn't always treat the worker great. I get all of that, but this is not about corporate America. This is about you and your personal integrity. An element of integrity is loyalty. So I think a little bit of what my grandfather had, a little dose of that would be good for every one of us to remember. If you don't like them, if you think they're a bunch of bozos, if you think they don't have integrity, if you think they don't pay enough, this is a free country. Quit. Get out. Stop. Why do you keep working for someone that you think is a crook and that mistreats people? That says more about you than it does about them. When you no longer trust leadership, when you no longer believe in the cause, when you don't think the product or the service that the company puts out is quality and you're no longer proud of it, that's God speaking to you. He's yelling at you. He's saying, I have something else for you. Leave. Go do something else. Leave. When your spirit leaves, for God's sakes, take your body with it. God has a plan for you. He loves you, and it's not to bring you harm. It's to bring you hope. He, he, he designed you in such a way that you're supposed to do certain things. Folks work for us for a season sometimes. Sometimes they're healing while they work for us, and they go out, and they start their own businesses sometimes. Sometimes they move on to other things. Sometimes they decide, I'm some kind of character, and they don't want to work for that kind of character. All of that is fine. The only thing that's not fine is staying in a place that you hate because it says more about you than it does about the place. Any of you old enough to remember when the real estate market crashed in 2008? You couldn't give a house away. House prices dropped. Some of the markets, the bubble burst. There was some dramatic bubble bursting out there. Well, I'm happy to report that almost every market um, has returned its value. Home prices are back to where they were and beyond, and most major cities in America today, the real estate market is white hot, like 98% of them. There's a few places that have problems that are not national economy problems, they're local economy problems, and uh, you know the micro issues within that city are screwing up the city, but that's different. Most neighborhoods in most cities right now are white hot. You put a house on the market, you get multiple bids by the weekend. Most of the time right now, you've got that. And that is driving prices up, of course. Because anytime you've got, it's a simple supply-demand economics lesson from the seventh grade, if you had seventh grade econ, if there's such a thing anymore. But, um, you know, when there's a limited supply and a whole bunch of people chasing that limited supply, that drives prices up. When there's an oversupply and not as many people chasing as something as much as there is supply, it drives prices down. It's called a glut in the market. It's pretty simple. We know that. Scarcity drives price up, in other words. And when a market is white hot like the residential real estate market is right now, prices are generally going up. Um, and, you know, that is creating a couple of situations in the real estate world that we're running into out here, and I'm talking to you about it. One problem 
is this. Market Watch came out this week and said 1.6 million homeowners are predicted to get new home equity lines of credit in 2018. Now that people have equity, what are they going to do? Go borrow it! Well, that's just stupid. But there's 1.6 million people out there. They're getting ready to do something stupid, according to this report. Don't go borrow your equity out of your house, especially on a freaking home equity loan. It's the credit card of the mortgage world. You know what a home equity loan is? It's a good chance for you to lose your home. Let me tell you why. Most of them have an annual or a biannual every two-year call in them, meaning the bank can just decide they want all their money, and you have to go get another loan or have the cash to pay them off right then, or they foreclose. I mean, it looks like something in an old 1930s movie or something. But everybody just bebops along and acts like it's nothing because usually they don't do that, but they have the right in the paperwork to just decide they don't like you anymore and call the loan. You know, the second thing is, you know what the interest rate on your home equity loan is based on? Your banker's mood. It's not tied to any index. It's not tied to any national publishing. It's somewhat controlled by competition. But you know when they change? They just change it. It's completely variable, and it's variable based on, I think we can get a little more out of George this week. Let's just raise it. And they just raise them. Or they might lower them, but not very often. And so you are setting yourself up in a piece of crap loan with a call and a variable rate that is based on the banker's whim. That's just dumber than a rock. That's just dumber. You are asking for trouble. And then when things turn down, you're going to go, oh, I didn't think that was stupid. Because, hey, when things are going really good, stupid gets covered up. Stupid can look smart when things are good. But like Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you can tell who was skinny dipping. When things go down, this home equity loan is going to be, oh, I had no idea. Well, where were you in 2008? I mean, were you not born yet? Seriously. How did you have no idea? You didn't even look at it. All you cared about was, I wanted a new kitchen, princess. Come on, shut up. Stupid butt stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't borrow this equity out. You're supposed to be building wealth in the ownership of your home, not constantly borrowing it out to buy crap. And that's what your home equity. I'm going to move my credit card debt over there. I paid off my credit card debt with a home equity loan. See, that statement right there is the dumbest thing I ever heard. Here's why it's dumb. You didn't pay off your credit card debt. You moved it onto your mortgage. So you go to the steakhouse and eat a steak, talk about buying a depreciating asset on debt, put that on a credit card, and then when you can't pay the credit card, you roll it over to a home equity loan. Then when you can't pay the home equity loan, you put it in your refinance on your new 30-year mortgage. So now you've financed a freaking stake over 30 years. This is stupid on steroids. And this is what people do regularly. This is a problem, folks. It's a problem. Every time things get good, people get lazy. Financially fat, sassy, and undisciplined and not watching what you're doing. One of the key elements to become a millionaire is not borrow on your house. It's get your stinking house paid off. It's one of the key elements of becoming a millionaire. All the data points show us that. This isn't the stuff I made up. Don't go borrow on your home equity loan. And oh, by the way, some of you that have been thinking about selling your house... I don't know what you're waiting on. I can't, you know, you're supposed to buy low and sell high. It's high. It's high. If you were ever going to sell a house, right now is the time to sell it. Right now, this minute. Jump online at DaveRamsey.com, click on ELP for real estate, get you one of these high-octane, high-protein real estate agents, and get the sign in the yard. I can do it myself because I'll just get multiple offers. Yeah, there's a good way to lose an extra 3%, and 3% of $200,000 is known as $6,000 because you don't know what the flip you're doing, and you're, you know, you hire a professional to work on your teeth. You hire a professional to do your will. You hire a professional to do your taxes and work on your car, but you're going to sell your largest asset by yourself. That's stupid. Don't do that. A monkey can sell a house in this market, but that doesn't mean they did it right. Don't hire a monkey. Don't hire a real estate agent. Just been in the business for 20 minutes because they're your relative. My aunt Jesse just got her license. That's a good way to screw stuff up right there. Stay away from Aunt Jesse till she figures out how to, you know, whew, like these doctors, my practice. That's because you're practicing still. Yeah, I mean, don't get somebody still practicing. Get a professional that's getting it done. 
that knows what they're doing. Somebody sells three houses a year and sold 10 houses in their lifetime doesn't need to be selling your largest house, your largest asset. Today's question comes from Tom in Pennsylvania. He says, my wife has always wanted to go see the Green Bay Packers at their home field. That's like me saying my wife's always wanted a new boat. Oh, come on. Okay, I'm sorry. I just, I couldn't. Okay, I got to keep reading. This year, they're playing the Eagles, my team. Oh, okay. Now I'm getting there. In November. We're on baby step three, and we won't have it completed until March of 2015. We've been arguing about it for quite some time. I don't think we should go, but she wants to. It'll cost $1,500 should we go or not. Well, you can do whatever you want to do. You're adults. You get to decide. But I will tell you my opinion. Um, I love football. I'm a season ticket holder at the University of Tennessee and at the Titans. And I will be at almost every home game of both of them this year. So I love that. But you know what? It, it's not instead of having an emergency fund to protect my family. Let me help you with this. It's a football game. That's a, a game. They don't pay you. You pay to watch them. It's a game. And you don't put that ahead of your family's financial foundation. I, I'm, I'm really sorry, but this is about time to put on your big boy pants and your big girl pants and say that we don't put games and luxuries ahead of our family's financial foundation. And when you're walking around without a rainy day fund, I mean, what if you go to the Packers game, you spend 1500 bucks, you got $2,000 in your emergency fund instead of 10 like you should have, and the next week you get laid off. The next week you have a car wreck. I'm not against football. I'm a huge football fan. And I'm not against spending $1,500 on a football game when you have one, when you have $1,500. So, and, you know, honestly, pl seeing the Green Bay Packers play at their home field is a, that's iconic. I agree with that. But you know what? I think they'll be playing next year. And I don't think they'll play the Eagles at home next year, probably a year after. Seems like they're in the same division, if I remember right. And so, uh, either way, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to this game. One of the things you have to do if you're going to win with money is you have to learn the ancient word. And the ancient word is an indication of emotional maturity. See, one definition of maturity is learning to delay pleasure. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. The ancient word is the word, it's a strange word. You've not heard it in a while. No one in America hears this word and no one likes it. It's politically incorrect. You can get thrown out of entire clubs, restaurants, and organizations for saying this word. People will ostracize you for saying this word. Are you ready? It's a nasty, nasty word, but it's very seldom heard, so you don't have to worry about hearing it much. No. That's the word. No. One, I, I'm convinced at the center of the degradation of the majority of our culture, the disintegration of our culture before our eyes is the inability of people to look at themselves and look at those they love and say, no. You could practice it with me. You push the, your tongue towards the roof of your mouth. You make a kissing motion with your lips, blow air past and release your tongue. It's a strange method, but you can do it. It sounds like, no. No. No, we can't afford it. Yet. No, we're not going out to eat tonight. We don't have any money. No, I'm going to vote you out of office because you don't know how to say no. Because all you know how to say is yes. You're in a government enabler. You're congressionally codependent. So no, we're going to vote you out of office. I want my money back. If you, got, if you went to any other organization other than your government and you got the buy that you get from your government, if you went into a restaurant and, the, the, and you were charged $20,000 for a meal like you are for a toilet seat when you buy one with your tax dollars through the government, you, you would say, I want my money back. This is ridiculous. You're, not, you're overcharging me. No, I'm not going to put up with this. 
No, I've had enough. What do you mean you're going to make raunchy jokes in front of me, the young lady says at work. No, I don't work here anymore because I'm not going to put up with you, you're scum. No. No. The employer says, no, you're not going to talk like that in our organization. You have to leave. No. Half the things wrong with our culture is because people don't have enough freaking backbone to say, no. No, you can't afford it. Now, all of society's ills are not camped on your head, um, Tom, over a football game. Don't misunderstand. But really, th this whole place, can we could all use a little growing up, and we just heard the word, no. No, I'm tired of you taking my private property away from me because you are righteous only with other people's money. Your taxation rate is just too high, so I'm going to fire you with my next vote. No, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. No. Seven-year-old is throwing a, a fit. The five-year-old, the four-year-old is throwing a fit, complete with snot flying everywhere, tears going everywhere, laying in the floor, spinning around like they're breakdancing in the cereal aisle of the grocery store. A complete freaking meltdown by a toddler or sub-toddler. You know what the answer is? Still. No. And now pain is going to follow if you don't get your little butt up and head towards the car. No. No. No is a complete sentence. And when I learned that word, it changed my life financially. When I got to the point that I could actually make a decision myself and look in the mirror and tell me no, then I was able to say yes. Because if you say no a while, if you live like no one else, if you pay a price to win, later you get to live and give like no one else. Sometimes I've had to look at people that were trying to feed hungry children or drill a well or put up mosquito nets or buy a car for a single mom. Someone was trying to put that money together and they asked me and I used to have to say no because I didn't have any money because all I had said is yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I want this. Yes, I'll have that. Yes, I have worked so hard, I deserve it. Oh, brother, you sound like you're four years old. Let me tell you what you deserve. Nothing. <laughs> Until you've saved up the money and pay for it. No. I know you've heard the word no more in the last five minutes than you have maybe in your entire life or certainly in the last six or eight months, because if you walk up and down the street and you have normal conversations with people in a politically correct society where everyone thinks they have nothing but rights and they have no boundaries and they spend all their lives walking around with a chip on their shoulder looking for an op opportunity to be offended by someone else, we just are not allowed to say no anymore. You can't say, you know, I believe differently than you, so no. That's intolerant. It's actually intolerant of my beliefs, but it's also intolerant. No. 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 Practice it with me, everyone. <laughs> mm, this is the Dave Ramsey Show. All right, look. Here's the deal. Your number one wealth building tool is your income. All of the millionaires that we interview, unless they inherited the money, which is very, very few of them, less than 10% of them inherited the money, did it by saving and investing their income. They did not give their income to Sally Mae. They did not give their income to Best Buy. They don't get screwed around and give their income to Lexus and Toyota and Ford and General Motors and American Distress and MasterCard. Who named that anyway? It's a mathematical thing. When you give your income to someone else, you don't have it anymore. Uh, is this hard? 
This is hard, isn't it? And when you give your income away, you have given up your economic future. All for crap. For a stinking flat screen. For sign- And listen, let me just tell you, here's the deal. You know, of the number of people that start college, how many graduate? 52%. That's an investment in my future. Said the other 48% that are sitting at home with no freaking degree, but by God, they got the student loan debt. And you know how you get rid of Sally Mae? You either pay her off in full or you die. That's the only way that woman goes away. It's not bankruptable. It is not an investment in yourself to borrow, even if it is an investment. We don't borrow money for investments. We don't borrow money for investments. I don't teach people to borrow money. The borrower is slave to the lender. That's what this math says. When you give up your income, when you give your income away, you have nothing. All the money comes in. All the money goes out. But by God, we're sitting around counting our Discover points. Oh, we got airline miles. Oh, Sally Mae's been with us for 15 freaking years in our spare bedroom. All because we called it an investment. I don't understand why it's bad. It's bad because it's stupid and you're normal. 70% of the Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That's stupid because you're living in one of the wealthiest countries the world has ever known, and there you sit like a rat in a wheel. Run, 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 run. Why? Because student loans are an investment and I'm going to Best Buy. This is just stupid. It's stupid on steroids. Really, seriously, you've got to stop and think. The a level of people's ability to do critical thought is almost zero. Good Lord. I get airline miles. Said no millionaire ever. Really. Millionaires do. I've met, I've met with thousands and thousands of millionaires. I've never met one that said, you know, Dave, I made my money with my airline miles. Oh, those Discover points broke me through financially. Hey, let's do the math, okay? You know how you get $1,000 back from Discover? You spend 100000 how does spending 100000 to get 1000 back ever make you rich? Where did you take your math class? Really? This is absolutely ludicrous. But everybody's counting their dadgum points, and everybody's trying to figure out some way I'm, getting, I'm, I'm beating up on Chase. Ch- your, Chase is kicking your butt. Their building's bigger than yours, and their furniture's nicer than yours. You ought to have a clue by now. At the car, and I got a car payment bigger than your house payment, some of you. Average car payment in America now is $499. That's suspiciously like 500 bucks. If you take $500 a month and invest it from age 30 to age 70, you'll have, would you believe it? You're going to have over $5 million. And you scratch your head and wonder why you're freaking broke. God, you, no wonder your kids' students, have, no wonder your students have student loans because you're driving a dadgum million dollar car, two million, three million dollar car. That's what it's costing you with your stupid car payment to impress somebody to stoplight that you will never meet and the thing's going down in value like a rock. We have to stop and think, America. You have to think instead of sitting around eating Skittles and watching Oprah reruns. This is stupid. We're fat and we're broke because we have no ability to do critical thought and we don't stop and look at what we're putting into our lives. This is nuts. It's nuts. It's completely out of control. I mean, the number of people I've talked to just today with twenty-five dollars and $30,000 owed on their stupid car. It's a car. Good God, it's a car. What does it do? It takes you from here to there. Now, I don't mind you having a $25,000 car. All of my cars cost more than $25,000, but I freaking paid for them, and they're a very small percentage of my life, a very small percentage of my income. Think, think, think. Seriously. So credit cards, stupid, stupid. Student loans, stupid. Car payments, stupid on steroids. Borrowing money on your house to put granite countertops in. Somebody ought to smack you. That's stupid. It's stupid. You have to stop and think again. It's because you're killing yourself. You make enough money to retire a millionaire or a multimillionaire. You make enough money that your kids ought to have a college fund fully funded and they can go to school without being part of the freaking student loan crisis. But by God, you had to have a bass boat so you're $32,000 in debt because those fish were outrunning you. God, think, 
think, think. Quit being grown-up children walking around in grown-up bodies. Adults devise, I mean, children walking around in grown-up bodies. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. This ridiculous, impulsive nature of we think we're going to borrow our way into wealth is it's, it's out of control, guys. We've got to stop this. It's killing you. It's killing you. While I'm sitting over here piling up money like it's dadgum nothing, and, and some of you are sitting there broke. Why? And then going, oh, I'm going to borrow money at Best Buy. Oh, jeez, I'm going to kill you. Seriously. I'm, I'm going to go borrow and get a student loan and invest in myself. Yeah, you're going to spend $140,000 and go in debt and get a degree in freaking left-handed puppetry. That's just dadgum stupid. It's just stupid. You have to think, people. You have to think. Quit giving your most powerful wealth-building tool away. It's your income. You're making everybody else rich. Think! All right, guys, my biggest takeaway is that so many people lack the basic knowledge about money. Even the simplest areas of personal finance, like budgeting, are way beyond what a lot of us were taught to do, which is not okay and why so many people find themselves in trouble. But listen, when you follow common sense money principles like the baby steps, you're going to set yourself up for incredible success later in life. And it's not always easy, but it's very simple and anyone can do it. I think that's why Dave gets so passionate about all of this and honestly why I'm so passionate about it too. Next up, we're gonna look back on Dave's best moments coaching people who ended up in a lot of financial trouble. So stick around and make sure to share this with a friend who needs to hear it. Thanks for watching.